Give us the story behind your glory. Everyone saw your names and they saw your titles, but I'd love for you all to talk about who you are, what you do, and if you want to mix it up a little bit and give us what the day in the life, a day in the life looks like from your lens. Let's start with you, Raju. Sure, but uh, I'm going to, after the session, talk to you about like getting some advice about my clothing, which is <laughs> amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Raju Narisati, I, uh, I lead publishing for McKinsey. Most of you, many of you probably know McKinsey as uh, a consulting firm. We kind of invented consulting about 98 years ago. But the part that some of you may not know is that McKinsey also invented this idea of thought leadership. Uh, we've been in publishing for about 59 years now. It began with a magazine called the McKinsey Quarterly, which still exists, um, and then morphed into a lot of reports, a lot of research uh, on a range of topics, mostly aimed at business audiences. As a result, um, internally inside McKinsey, there's a pretty large publishing content creation uh, increasingly a visual storytelling multimedia uh, team, which I uh, manage. My background has mostly been in media, uh, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and um, I've been at McKinsey for about uh, four years now. Um, I, I grew up in India. Um, I was terrible at math and science, so couldn't become an engineer or a doctor, <laughs> which is what many Indians do. Um, ended up in journalism and then uh, moved here about 35 years ago to get my master's and then ended up staying here. Um, I, I mean, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but my day is mostly meetings. Uh, I have a team of about 125 people, and um, so I, it's mostly about people uh, issues. I do edit, uh, occasionally I go in and change a headline and more creative things like that. Um, my team is used to, Mike who runs our internship and fellowship program is here actually. They're used to getting like 4.30 a.m. email saying we should do something about this. Right? I, they all know that they don't have to reply when I email them. They can reply their normal day as well. So that's kind of my day. I you love have to that. learn how to schedule send, like send your emails at 8.15 in the morning. Because Mike would receive about 10 emails at 9.30, which would actually probably be worse for him. <laughs> so all my emails say at the bottom that I work at my schedule, you should work on your schedule. So they all that. know it now. A true communications expert. I love that. All right, Kate, let's go to you. All right, similar to Raju, this is probably the most exciting part of my day today um, in the fact that, you know, meetings all day long as well. I'm sorry to burst anyone's bubble, but that's just what life is like. Um, but I was telling Rafia that it's actually, it's, it's fun because I get to talk. I'm going to frame it in a different way. Um, I'm going to go PR on us right now. It's fun because I get to talk to so many different people every single day in 30 minute increments. Um, <laughs> and my brain is, is trying to catch up right now. But um, 40 years ago on July 28th, I was born and we'll, we'll fast forward to, I started, um, I went to school for broadcast journalism, dabbled in television production after that, um, worked at Discovery. So I call myself ex Warner Brothers now, but I can't take credit for that. Um, and found myself in the last six years, seven years, at a brand, which is sort of the dark side a little bit. Um, and I head up the content studio at Married International. Yes, we make films. Um, and similar to Raju, the company is approaching its 95th year, so wow. an older company. Um, and really making it relevant to audiences like you. So what I was telling Rakia earlier is, my group is really at the video vanguards. So we're evangelizing how important video is to contributing and developing emotional resonance with audiences where they are. So on YouTube, on streamers, on Netflix, on Hulu, um, on TikTok, on Instagram, all the relevant places. So that is, that's kind of my, my day to day is a whack-a-mole really of just things that pop up and trying to figure out priorities and move things forward. It wouldn't be any other way at a brand. So right. there's that. All right, Sam. Um, so I have spent my whole career in trade publishing. So working for Scholastic, Simon & Schuster, Penguin, Hachette. And I've always worked in children's publishing. I would not have it any other way. Um, I have no interest in working in adult publishing. I'm in it for the kids' content. I'm in it for the art, for the creativity and the playfulness. Um, so little by little in my career, I started working on licensed publishing. So basically that means that some other entity owns the content that we're working on. So a Barbie book, for example, I work for Mattel. 
Um, so I did a little bit of that and then a little more and then a little more. And then, um, you know, 15 years later, um, I was working completely on licensed publishing and I love it. It's very much like a puzzle. You know, you're given the sandbox of Barbie and a company is letting you play in it, but there are guardrails. You have to stay in it, but you also have to be really creative while you're in there. So um, I worked at a bunch of different houses and, you know, moved up the ranks and um, was uh, looking for, you know, my next adventure. And I saw a position open up at Mattel. Um, so it, for the work that I was doing, it's kind of like switching sides of the table. So instead of being at the publishing house, talking to Mattel, figuring out how to make books, now I'm at Mattel deciding how we make the books. Um, so a day in the life for me is thinking a lot about Barbie, um, Thomas, Polly Pocket, um, so many different wonderful brands, Monster High, and figuring out what kind of publishing we're gonna do. And so that means working with a lot of internal teams, a seemingly endless list of internal teams um, to make that happen. And my day is filled with meetings. I, I know, it's really, it's really depressing that that's what it's become. It's like, if I'm good and I do all my meetings, maybe I'll get to do something creative. Well, they don't call sorry, it work yeah. for nothing. I know. It's not working. You're not working. <laughs> so there's yeah. that. Well, you know, you all are so planted, you know, in your careers, and it seems like you all have had some amazing journeys to get there. Would love to talk about the earlier days, especially, let's rewind the tapes all the way back to the internship days. Are there any particular, in, you know, internships that you all had that you feel like contributed to where you are today? And if so, give us some like real tactical examples. Right. Kay, you look like you want to go first. I don't have a sexy answer for this, unfortunately, but my, my internship senior year of college turned into my first job and then kind of blossomed from there. So I think the advice I would give there, so I worked as a, an intern at Home and Garden Television my senior year. So DIY Required was the show that I was helping on. And I think my advice there and something I embodied but didn't realize it until later in my career was just this like curiosity, say yes, say yes to most things. Um, try to do the things you say yes to really, really well. And just don't think of yourself as just an intern. Approach it like this is your full-time job and you're here to meet as many people as you can and kind of add value to the organization. So I feel like I did that. And then another piece of advice is don't graduate on Saturday and start your first job on a Monday. <laughs> so take a break. Um, but, you know, I, I did that and it turned into where I am today. Awesome. Sam, what about you? Um, I don't think that I really had traditional internships, but there were lots of little things I did along the way that I think helped me get where I was. So in um, high school and college, I wrote for the school paper. So for me, it was all about writing. My, you know, from really middle school through college, I writer, I always had a journal. Um, so writing for the school paper, um, I think was a really great opportunity. Um, I also worked at a children's museum near where my college was. So trying to stay in that I just stayed in the sphere of the things that I was interested in, which was for me, it always boiled down to kids, art and writing. So just even if the things that I did weren't like a children's museum was kind of tangential, but that kept me immersed in the world of kids and how they were learning and how they were being creative. So even though it may not seem like, you know, the exact right fit, it still was building up those skills. So my entire career is based off one internship. I had wow. come from India, um, you know, English is not my native language. I have an accent even now. Um, and I uh, came to do my master's at Indiana University in Bloomington. And that year I was one of 12 summer interns that the Wall Street Journal chose. And that was the beginning of my U.S. career for two reasons. One, it gave me the confidence that I can actually operate in the U.S. Um, at a level of the Wall Street Journal. It gave me that confidence. I always thought I could, but that was a proof point. Mm -hmm. And two, it, I think it showed them that, um, you know, here's somebody who could do that. And the way I, it was in Pittsburgh, uh, one of, you know, at that time, a dozen bureaus they had. And I would really every day go in and say, here are five story ideas. Mm -hmm. And four of them were complete crap, or, or the, you know, Wall Street Journal. Um, but some of them were actually not so bad. So I ended up doing 
in a 10 week internship, eight articles. This was pre-internet, so it may not seem today like that's not a lot of articles, but 10 or eight articles in 10 weeks in the Wall Street Journal published was like a pretty big deal at that time. And, but I didn't get a job after that. I went back, finished school, ended up at a paper in Dayton, Ohio. But two years later, I got a call saying, you know, we've been actually tracking your work. And we are hoping, would you like to come? It's amazing. I'd love like it. to come, right? And so that was actually, you know, um, and that set me up for, I spent the next 14 years at the journal, and then I've done a bunch of other things. But for that internship, I don't think I would have, you know, done everything else. So, I mean, it's a real, a catalyst and a turning point. You know, well, you make me think of something. You said you were one of 12 and you did something to make yourself stand out. So in the words of the great prophet Beyonce, how do you make yourself one of one? So like what, and basically, what do you do to stand out? Like, were there anything, like for you, you talked about submitting five stories and just, you know, giving, giving your all and just throwing things out and making sure that something stuck. But Kate and Sam, were there things that you did in your internship to be one of one to stand out? I feel like you need to answer this question because of the, <laughs> the multi-hyphenate intro that you had. You are truly one of one. Um, I think it just what I was saying before is sort of showing up, right? Adding value. I think Raju's point about law of averages or the 80-20 rule, is the, the more you're up at that, the more likely you might get the first or a home run or whatever analogy or metaphor you want to use. But I think just showing up as, you know, who you are, don't try to be someone else, um, but just be present and, and raise your hand and yeah, just be, I think curiosity, I think that's something that I, people will say that is something about me professionally, but also personally, I've, I've felt like a lifelong learner. I'll read the most random books just to learn something new and look at the world in a different way. Um, so I would approach, that'd be my advice too, is just show up and ask questions in a non-annoying way. Um, but ask questions and be curious about things. And I would say also, don't write a script for your life. I think we all sort of can, can relate to that as like, you might have goals and a vision for what you want to create or a position that you want to do, but really think about, you know, collecting skills. I like to think of it like a toolbox of sorts. I love metaphors, if you can't tell, but um, my career has definitely been just collecting different skill sets. Like I, I never knew or purposefully it was like, I want that job and went after that specific job. It was always about, you know, an opportunity that arose or something that kind of blossomed or snowballed into something new. I don't know if that answers. No, that's good. That's good. Go ahead. I think just adding to that asking questions in my own personal life and profession, like I am my friend, I'm notorious for asking a ton of questions. Like my curiosity is, can be endless. So I think finding the right moments um, to ask those questions um, in a work environment, um, to me, that's such a sign of intelligence. It, it, also asking the stupid question, I think shows the most intelligence mm -hmm. because you're brave enough, you're being brave enough to say like, I'm not sure I quite got that. Can you, can you help me? Can you help me understand that? And um, it also means you're listening. I've uh, just hired someone on the team. So I'm just very aware of that. Um, and yeah, also um, being proactive saying, oh, can I help with that? You know, I think that's also would be, you know, really appreciated in internship situation or I see you're really busy. Is there something I can do to help with that project? Or, you know, that sounds like that has a million different parts that need tending to. Can I help with one of them? So I think just being present um, and offer, offering help is always good. Yeah, I love that. Well, I think, you know, I'd love to maybe address how many of you in here would consider yourselves a creative? All right, let's walk it like we talk it. So Adobe did a study a few years ago and they said that, you know, the creator economy over the past two years, I think the study was done in 2022 and the creator economy had grown by 70%. So essentially 165 million people were in the creator economy. And we, we've gotten to a point where pretty much everyone is a creative. The challenge with that, because we all love being creatives, the challenge with that is sometimes job descriptions or internship requirements or the thing that you want to apply for doesn't really jump out and say, 
creative, like creatives wanted. And Raju, you said something next to me when we spoke uh, and it was essentially, you know, what, what I do, you know, in the world of, you know, research. And I want you to expand here for the creatives in the room. How do they end up at a McKinsey? What does it look like for a creative to work at McKinsey? Or how, is, how important is a McKinsey, which is research focused and the foundation is there, how, how does that apply to the creatives in the room? Well, I mean, if you're not creative, you probably won't end up at McKinsey anyway, right? I mean, part of our, we are typically, I mean, on the consulting side, we are hired by big companies like Mattel and Hilton, not specifically, but like them, uh, to come in and kind of help them think through some major issues, right? So you have to be creative about problem solving because if you're not, they don't need you, actually. Right? They can solve it by themselves. On the publishing side, I mean, most of, um, I have a 120% team. Um, it's just like a newsroom minus the news. I have 28 editors. I have a 15% visual storytelling team. Uh, I have an audience development and innovation team. We have 28 podcasts. So we have all of the things that you normally associate with a normal newsroom or a content creator, it's just that it's all inside McKinsey and in the service of uh, McKinsey's clients. Um, I mean, creative could be two things, right? I think the conventional thinking is like a piece of content or you know, uh, visual or audio or video. But a lot of our creative is also we create original content in the sense that we have a 30,000 research panel. Mm -hmm. So when things happen, we could quickly go to them and say, what are you doing about it? And get a lot of information back. And that's original content, right? You're creating a body of knowledge and then our role in publishing is then taking that and putting it in the form that people can understand, right? Uh, so two levels of creation. One is actually coming up with original um, insights and then packaging and presenting it to the right audience. Uh, so it's all creative all the time. You're right that, you know, uh, a job that says uh, an assistant managing editor may not automatically jump at you as being creative, but 90% of the work you do is either creating or manipulating in a good way, right? Content. So it's all about creation. I love that. And I love that you talked about problem solving because in the world of marketing and communications, we talk about iterative thinking all of the time. And when some pe people hear iterative thinking, they think more on the scientific side. Mm -hmm. But the way that you just described it really, you know, essentially brings us to this thought of create. Creativity can lie anywhere. It can be in your writing, you know, in, from a publishing standpoint. It could be in the back-to-back -back meetings and scheduling them the right way. Like you, you were creative in a solution-based thought for Raju, and you said, "Do the schedule send?" So creativity can can show up everywhere. Uh, Kate, I'd love just from your you, you know your standpoint how creativity shows up in the work that you do every single day and for all of the creatives in the room, if they're thinking about that first step at, you know, uh, you know, at the Marriott, you know, and, and the content that you all are doing, what does it look like from an entry level standpoint? So I'll say two or three things. Keep me, keep me short and sweet um, if I go on a tangent. So I think creativity is, I, I actually think it is a scientific process, mm. right? Because I think every piece of content, whether it's your personal Instagram page or it's a feature film, it's a hypothesis, right? It's I a like hypothesis. That. If somebody, is someone out there going to resonate or is this going to be relevant? Does this have an audience? And then you get a feedback loop. I think, you know, working in a brand, my feedback loop is in the paid media or the platform channels, right? So creativity is, and the, the second thing I'll say is that the creative part of the process, the actual asset is like, 5% of the, of the thing. I know we look at it and we're like, I'm so proud of this film or this piece of content. Um, but really what's, what the creative strategist side of me is it's just a piece of content. What's the channel strategy? What's the distribution strategy? How, how many leaders do I have to convince to help me, you know, approve a budget for this? Um, what do I do with my media agency? How do I engage PR to talk about this? So the actual piece of content, while it might take months to create and a lot of creative heart and soul, it's everything outside of it that's that's sort of where my creative, where I think about that as what I add to the, the creative pile. 
So to actually answer the question that you asked is what does that look like in an entry level position? I think it's, it's exactly that. I think creativity or thinking of yourself as a creator is meant to be like, can you, can you work within parameters? Right. Cause I think the most creative that we can be, or at least how I look at it is when you are not boxed in, but when you have a constraint. And I think that's where creativity really blossoms. I keep using the word blossom and bloom. Yeah. Um, I'm inspired by, you know, the colors in your outfit, the florals. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, I think we are most creative when we're problem solving, like you said. I think that's, it's, it's separate than, and I guess how it relates to entry level, it's pro- problem solving. You mentioned this too. It's really about what are the challenges and how can I come at something a different way or look at it like macro level, look at what my goals are and what, what we're trying to achieve here. What are the goals? And what are, what are the hurdles that we're going to find along the way? And how do I think about those things ahead of time and try to solve for them, but also be nimble as they're happening? Mm, yeah, I love it. Listen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sam, what about you? I'm sure creativity <laughs> oozes out of everything that you do. But, but let's talk about it. So, you know, on the most obvious level, we're creating kids books. So right now it is on my plate to figure out Barbie fiction for teenagers, for adults. What is it? Does anyone care? Does anyone want to read it? What would, what would it be if it's not tied into the movie? Like that's pretty amazing and creative. Um, or it's, you know, being shown a episode of a new series that Mattel is creating and then figuring out how we're going to do publishing to tie into that. But I want to like put all that stuff aside. Cause I, <laughs> I agree that, you know, so much of what I do is creative, but not the obvious creative. So we talked about problem solving, scheduling. So right now I'm in a situation where I need to make a Hot Wheels handbook for kids in like three months and it's not pretty. It's not going to be, it's going to be very difficult. So it's like, I have three months, I have to make this book. How am I going to make this book? So a schedule, just getting creative in it, you know, with, well, okay, if I can do this in this amount of time and then I can hand it off to somebody else and well, while that's happening, why don't we put you know, this other part of the book on a parallel track. I mean, it's, it's can get really, you have to get really creative to make it happen. Um, Also the idea of pitching something or selling something internally um, takes so much creativity, whether, right, you're putting together the deck, that's creative. You need the ideas that went into the deck. Okay. That's creative. But how do you position it to the people who are listening to you to get the yes? So do you put, you know, of your three cons, you know, it, is one of the three concepts like, eh, you could let that one go. Everyone likes to say no to something. So there's something in there that they can say no to. You're also making sure you, you know, you you have to really set yourself up to get that yes. And that I think takes a lot of creativity. Um, And um, one other thing about being uh, entry level is being a part of brainstorms. That's something that we do a lot of. So just using the Barbie example, what could we do? What kind of fiction would work for Barbie? What else? Are there any other brands that we can look at what they've done and get some, you know, intel that way, get some inspiration, read the reviews on Amazon? Like, I think, I think even coming up with beautiful Excel grids is creative. I, I, I don't know. I think, I think it would probably help everyone to expand their view of what is creative rather than just the on the nose part, which I think between us, like we're agreeing that's the chair, the the actually making of the movie, making of the book, coming up with the idea is sort of the cherry on top of the work. Mm. There's so much else and it's still amazingly creative. It just, you gotta change your view of, you know. Yeah, I love that you talked about selling something. I remember at one point in my career, I was media training a bunch of folks to be on air for HSN. And one of the things that I would ask them is to sell me a pen. And the, the responses that you would get from people <laughs> on the pen and how the pen felt in your hands and how the pen would write, you'd be so surprised what the stories and the storytelling that could come out of one single thing. But it also leads me to just the climate that we're in, in terms of the external compounded stress. We are all exposed to so much now. We're inundated with massive amounts of media 
And I think for creatives, I would ask, and this is, you know, I might be speaking out of turn here just because for the creatives in the audience as well, but how do you remain creative? What inspires you to create other than, you know, I have to get up every day and do the thing, but in a world where we are exposed to external compounded stress on a regular basis, how do you stay creative? What motivates you to create? And how do you stay inspired? I think Kate made a point earlier about constraints, right? which actually are very positive in the sense that most of you joining an organization will realize that there's like a lot of constraints. But some of that is, so take McKinsey, for example. Um, there's a perception of what McKinsey is, and it's like what I would call, we have a brand license in people's minds. I can't suddenly become um, BuzzFeed in my presentation. We do our, by the way, we invented five imperatives and five things and eight things. And like well before BuzzFeed did. But I have to do it in a way that people say, okay, this makes sense, mm -hmm. right? I can't be clickbaity. So those constraints actually might seem like especially when you're young and new to an organization, might seem like, God, this is such a bureaucratic place. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that it's a very outside in view of it, right? Saying, what do our customers and clients expect from us? Mm -hmm. And do we have the license to kind of, you know, stray too far from it? I think we should stretch the boundaries and that's where the creativity comes. But to be able to do it within those constraints actually is a lot more challenging than if somebody said, just go do whatever you want to do with this, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that's kind of something that we all see. I, definitely, lots of constraints at a global <laughs> organization. I, I think to, to answer your question, it's it's going to be, in, how do you keep that creative spark going? Yes. Um, and I think that, you know, there's an idiom that's like, you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. So you this is going to be individual. You're going to have to find what really keeps your your soul going. Um, just very practical, tactical advice from me is I take calls. I get out of my apartment and I take calls when I walk because being outside, even when it's cold, like it is right now, just having sunlight and reminding me that there's a world out there and it's not just this little box of people on my video screen. Um, that oddly enough kind of keeps me going and actually, you know, fills my creative cup in a way. And I would also say just, um, it depends, again, this is an individual answer, but you know, consuming, I feel like I am inspired by good creative. So watching a good movie, listening to a good podcast, scrolling Instagram for, you know, what are people doing? Um, kind of what's what's funny, what's lighthearted, what's serious, what, are, what issues are people facing? I think that that helps me just kind of orient on the things, you know, the, we keep talking about meetings, but it, it makes you realize that there's a purpose. There's something you're doing and that there are people on the other side of the walls and the screens that you're creating for. Mm -hmm. So I love a good walk meeting. Sam, okay. what about you? Um, I think for me, your question just made me think about my early career. And um, I am also a writer. And, you know, in my early career, I, could, I wouldn't say that I was creative creatively very fulfilled. I mean, it was a lot of admin work. So I had a, a lot of hunger mm. to be more creative. And I also had, you know, what I felt was a story that I really needed to tell. So I was, since I didn't have that sort of creative cup being filled at work, I really wanted to fill it on my own. And then as my job changed and my job got more and more creative, like I, there's, I got nothing left at the end of the day. There's no more, there's no more extra creativity for me to put you know, into other projects. So I think part of it is just the hunger um, that you have something that you just, you need to get, you have to get it off of you. I know that's a different, a, you know, a different answer, but. No, um, I love it. So if you can't, if you're not getting the creativity in your work, you know, it's got to go somewhere. I mean, if you're all identifying as creatives, then you know how it feels that like your fingers are like vibrating and you, you know, there's something that you have to tell or something that you have to make. Um, so just finding that that space. I don't think I answered the question. No, you did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Well, I, we don't have a, a ton of time before we open it up for questions. So I'm going to move on to another C word, and that is connections. So, you know, in this industry, a lot of it is based on connections. And, and if you say no, you know, tell me why. But, you know, are there specific networking tips that you've seen other folks that have reached out to you? Maybe it was an email from someone requesting an internship or was it, 
an email for someone wanting to meet with you. Can you give us any great examples of networking, whether it was you doing it in a room or whether it was someone reaching out to you? I can, I can answer it. So I actually got laid off from my last job mm. and um, that was terrifying. And I'm an only parent, uh, an only parent to a toddler. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? And um, when I looked at the publishing landscape, there were, there were no jobs that were the job for me. Like, oh, a publishing director, editorial director, kids, but there was, there was literally no job. And, um, I just went through my LinkedIn. I went through, you know, every person that I had worked with at every, you know, you know, Warner brothers, Mattel. Um, and I just started emailing, you know, to, and I just, you know, was very thankful that I had good relationships with these, you know, these were all people that I had very nice relationships with. And I thanked my stars for that because, if I didn't have those pleasant relationships, there was nothing to be calling on. Um, and, and, and that's really, I wouldn't have found a job without the, that networking, um, the job at Mattel. Um, I'd say that if, if there's any way that you have a personal, like if you're trying to get to someone at Mattel, like see if there's someone in between the two of you that maybe you both know. I know you're, you know, you guys are still in school or just graduated and that might be a little harder, but uh, you know, I just checked my LinkedIn and I saw a fr uh, very good acquaintance said, I know so-and-so at DC Comics and he'd love to meet you. I'm going to answer that. I have like a million other messages from strangers in my inbox. So it's like, can you find someone in the middle? Mm -hmm. Ask favors, ask your parents, ask your family, ask, you know, anyone who could make any kind of introduction for you. Warm introductions, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna it guess, does. I'm going to yes and that because I agree with everything you said. And I also think that piece of advice I would give, it's, it's don't do it in service of the job. Mm. So I think you were saying like you had these connections already that you could leverage when you were in that moment. But think of networking as just building your community, building your connective tissue, right? So it's, it's not always the thing that's going to be linear and say, okay, I met this person, therefore there's a job here and I'm going to get that job. But think of it as just your network of people that come from different walks of life and different organizations at different leadership levels. Um, and it's also not one way. So like everyone sitting in this room right now, these are your connections too. So don't just look to us on stage, but you know, meet the people that are sitting next to you. I think that's really important. And I'd say that that sort of serendipity of connection is I, honestly every job that I've had in my career comes from it wasn't like a I saw a post and applied to it it came from a you would be good for this I have something open friend of a friend of a friend of a friend That's awesome. that kind of stuff so it's it's I really do believe in that and the last thing I'll say there is um when I like don't don't be scared or frightened by titles. You know, people are just people. We're all human. Um, you know, we have big jobs, but we're, we're, I just have never been, um, a person who walks into a room and is intimidated by like the person with the highest title. Um, I'll go up to them and just be like, what'd you eat breakfast for this morning? Like, mm -hmm. tell me about a, a place in New York that you like to go to. Um, so I really, I do think just connecting on a human level, just like, who are you and show up as that person and actually be interested and the people that you're talking to and kind of what they have to say. I love that. Um, I'm an introvert, so I'm really terrible at networking. <laughs> um, but there's never been a time for networking, and there's also never been a worse time for networking. Um, uh, the, the reason why I say it's never been a better time is that we all have the ability to connect with people through technology and platforms. I mean, LinkedIn may seem like a boring place for some of you when you're very young, but it's actually a very effective way to. Uh, Engage, not just engage, but also see what your, um, you know, second degree relationships are and all of that. Um, for example, I there's literally no DM that comes to me on LinkedIn that I don't reply. I might that. take it might take like a couple of days sometimes because I'm just busy. But uh, and people underestimate the ability to DM somebody and they think that nobody's but often times people actually like respond. And if you're especially being like transparent about it, right? That you're not trying to, or you're respecting people's time. I mean, you, if somebody says, I need mean, half hour of your time, can I get to know you? I'm like, be more specific, right? So that part is really great. I think our ability to reach all people has never been better. The part that I'm worried about is that the post pandemic 
work from home, not wanting to go to the office, all of that, right? It's fine. I mean, we have making we really don't fuss about whether you're coming in or not. But you are missing a significant opportunity if you're not going into a workplace. It's not just about your boss and everything else, but like the network of people you can relate to or a coffee or the party or something. So I, know, I would like think a little bit about like going in if you have a choice of not going in, because it is uh, it's a way to create some networks and Oftentimes we all move from jobs and you never realize that somebody you met like in some other casual conversation in your workplace is, is the person who's at the other place. Right? So um, I don't worry about that. A lot of people are just kind of doing the cost kind of benefit of like you know, commute and all that and I work from home. That's great. But you're missing out on that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that. We, I want to ask one more question before we open it up to questions. I'm going to give you all 30 seconds, and you can answer either question, okay? 30 seconds, that's all you have. You can answer either question. One is, what advice would you give to your 23-year-old self, or what do you love most about your job? Two seconds to think about it. Are we all going at the same time? That would be funny. I'll go. I spent 14 years in my first job. That was about 10 years too long. Since then, I've had like jobs in about three to five years. And the way I've thought about jobs that most of them, like Kate was saying, have come my way. And I almost always ask this question, when is the last time I did something for the first time? And if some, this McKinsey job, I've never done B2B publishing. I've always in, been in B2C. And when they came to me, I was like, I actually can do a lot with the, help them, but I'm also going to learn a lot because I've never done this before. Right? So that's been a good way for me to think about. So I would... Uh, I would not worry so much about going to a place and then sticking around uh, for a very long time. I and mean, you should stick around for a reasonable time. What's the longest you've been at a job? Uh, my first job, 14 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. After that, everything has been between three and five. <laughs> <laughs> Does my work work? Okay. okay. <laughs> so it was, what do I love about my job or advice to 23-year-old self? Got it. Okay. Um, can I do 15 and 15? All right. I love my job because I get to push an organization in new directions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to sort of the point we've all been saying and the point you just made is, am I learning? Am I learning something every day? Um, and when I stop learning, I get stagnant. And that's that's a signal that it's time to move on. So I'll tie it to the, the first. The second part is the advice I'd give my 23-year-old self is, when you stop learning, when you're not advancing, when, you sh when you're kind of showing up and sort of rolling your eyes every day, I, I won't say leave, but it's time to find something new. It's either time to find something outside the organization or inside or think about how your current role can expand. And I think there's a lot, the answer is never, like you don't have to leave the company to get more creative in your role or take on new responsibilities, but challenge yourself to keep learning. That's what I would, I would say. Um, I'm going to go with advice for the 23-year-old. So um, be a little brave, you know, really try to stretch yourself, um, apply for the job where you only meet half of the bullet points. No one meets all of those bullet points. So if you, if you got half, you definitely should be applying, maybe not even half. Um, ask for more money. And the ladies, <laughs> advocate for yourself. Like I, you know, as I progressed in my career, I got better at it, but I'm constantly amazed at um, the lack of people advocating for themselves financially. So, you know, be brave. Um, it's okay to try stuff for a little while. Try something else, you know, fill up that toolbox. Um, but I think it takes a lot, of, a lot of bravery at your age to, you know, step out there and try new things and, you know, probably get it wrong a little bit. And try something else. I love it. Ask for more money is what I heard. <laughs> as, a, as an owner of a company, I get people pitching me salaries all of the time. I think people are really brave. That's all I'm going to say. And, and I have, I've seen just a change over the past five years when, you know, we do hiring. I'm the last person to, you know, interview someone. I have a, a team of 20 people and there are like three people on my team that do all of the interviewing. And you know, folks will come to me and, you know, they pitch these high salaries and I'm like, oh my gosh. And they'll say, oh, well, someone told me to aim higher or so someone told me to advocate for myself. So the people are listening. 
We thank you for telling people to advocate for themselves. Would love for you all to ask questions. If you could say your name, just so we know who you are. And yeah, come up to the microphone. Hi everybody, my name is Geraldine Enriquez. I'm not an undergrad. I graduated four years ago from Kansas University. Um, I'm a two-time author. I recently got laid off, and I'm trying to figure out how to pivot because I realized I love what I did. I was a program manager. I worked with students like yourselves. It was it was amazing, but I wanted to do something more creative. So Sam mentioned something about going outside for creativity if you can't do it in your work, and that's what I did by publishing both my books. Um, but yeah, we'll just ask, what advice would you give to somebody that's interested in pivoting to a more creative career? If your um, background looks like it's all over the place, I started my career in sales and pivoted into program management. So, what do you love? Hmm. I love writing. <laughs> then do find find that like do that do what you love. Like I know it sounds cheesy, but chase what you love and then get someone to pay you for it. Like that's that's the ideal scenario. So I, I don't know if you guys have more practical, that it's not as practical, but I really think that that's, especially when you're making a career pivot, when you're jumping sort of 180 or 90 degrees elsewhere, it's really like, what can I, what, what can I do that is going to keep me fulfilled? And what do I love doing? If you love writing, like there's, there's a lot of opportunity. It might not look like, you know, the way that you envision it, but be open to sort of smaller chunks and opportunities and it'll get you, you know, you can practice. I would also add to that writing is so essential for so many things. You could start a sub stack and have people subscribe, like just from a tactical standpoint, and also reach out to people to ask them if you could freelance. You know, we hire writers all of the time and folks that have had non-linear paths, but it's such an essential, crucial point to everyone's job. And you have so many people out there that are selling and pitching, but they don't necessarily have the fundamentals of writing. So that, and tell people that is your zone of genius. My zone of genius is writing, and I'd love to work with you in some sort of capacity, even if it's in a freelance capacity. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. My name is Jennifer Zorov. Um, I'm a recent dual MBA grad. And my question, thank you. Um, so I've worked in the marketing world before, but I think something that I, I'm always questioning, but something that I'd like to ask for others in terms of being a newbie is finding your brand voice, especially like you said, you have been in a company that's been around for 90 plus years. How do you come up with that brand voice besides research from other years um, and still remain relevant? So like it's, I know that a lot of companies are hiring younger people. I know one of my first jobs was B2B and it took the fun out of all of the social media posts, but that's just how it was. It depends like for each thing. So I guess for consulting, how do you find your brand voice for the different types of brands you work with? And how do you find ones for legacy brands? My suggestion would be, and you'd be surprised at the number of people who don't do this, who come and talk to us for jobs. They don't read what we publish. Okay? Because if you do that, and for example, we have 52 different newsletters on a range of topics, right? So you could almost pick something and say, I, here's what I've read, and two ways to approach it, right? One is to say, ask questions around, why do you do it this way, right? Without saying, you thought it sucked. Or saying, um, here are a couple of ways I would have done it differently. We actually, all of our testing, by the way, we, we give people a bit of a writing test when they are are all aimed at like finding that, right? And we're asking people, how would you have done something differently? So bringing your voice, but also understanding that, like I said, you can't be very flippant about something if you're at McKinsey because we write about serious things. But you can extend that a little bit, right? And make it more interesting. So I think that's a usually a good way to show that you have a bit of a voice and you're willing to apply it and push the boundaries. And that's what gets us excited about people we talk to. It's a complicated question. So I work at a company that has 32 plus brands and then has an overarching loyalty travel program, which we are working on, you know, building its brand awareness. So imagine every single day and not every single day, I'm, I'm being a little bit ridiculous, but like 33 different brand voices coming to life. And I think your question was like, how do you make that relevant today? And it's sort of like not holding it super sacred, like letting it evolve. 
and adjusting for the times and, and your audience. Um, so I, I would apply that too. I think your advice was really good about just, you know, thinking about who's on the other end. I'm constantly audience first, like thinking about who is my message for. And I think your brand voice as is a result of that, right? It's like, how do I want to best reach the, the goal and the people that I'm trying to reach? If that's helpful. Um, hi, I'm Chloe. I'm an upcoming, I'm a senior studying illustration and animation at Marymount Manhattan College on the Upper East Side. And I was wondering if you guys had any advice to someone who wants to get into the industry, but they're not living near that industry. So I'm interested in narrative storytelling um, and animation. Um, a lot of things I see in New York City are revolve around advertising and the bigger like narrative storytelling studios are in California and in Canada. What advice would you give to someone who can't, who doesn't live in either of those places and like I can't get an internship aside, you know, because I know getting hired from within after an internship is, you know, one of the best ways and easiest ways. What advice would you give to someone who can't do that? Would it be to take any re relating position where I am? Because I do see a lot of publishing and advertising, but is that the route to go or is there something else available? I think that's for me. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm from Maryland. So I would say where Marriott International is headquartered, um, you know, I had my television production career, but DC is very TV based, New York, like you mentioned, and then LA. So I just moved up here in May. Um, but I think it's, it's sort of what you make it. I, if you are, if you don't want to move to LA, that's okay. But I would, I think in the New York area, there's opportunities for narrative storytelling. Literally the company that I work at, there's opportunities for narrative storytelling in, in my you know, team, if you want to talk later. Um, but I think it's, you even, I think you had a solution to your own question is like find where, you know, kind of look at what the sort of publishing and media world is here and then find out, do they have content teams? Do they have studio teams? Even at the media agencies, they're negotiating and doing narrative storytelling. So I would, I would sort of narrow your focus and then have like a little list, um, you know, four or five and, and start doing reach outs in that way and say, this is what I'm interested in. You can do informal mentorships. I think we've talked a little bit about that off to the side. It's just, you know, a mentorship or an internship doesn't have to be formal to be valuable. Um, so just having, you know, meeting people for coffee and having a conversation and just like searching for folks in the New York area and being like, can I get to know you? Can I take you to coffee? Can we, can we grab 15 minutes and ask you some questions? I think that would be where I would start. If you really, if you love New York so much, you don't want to leave the area. And Sam, you're actually a good example. The company is Mattel. Yeah. It's all, it's all the way on the West Coast, but yeah. you're here. So yeah, yeah. I, yeah my, my, what I was going to say is just get, get as close to the thing you want to do as you can, <laughs> you know, just so if it's in a place that you didn't quite expect, like I think anything where you're working on narrative, working on animation, like that is going to be your entry point to get to the you know, Pixar later. Um, and, you know, the job was posted, my job was posted for LA. Um, but I wrote and said, you know, are you open to New York? I think it's, you know, it, it never hurts to ask. Um, yeah. Earlier in my career, when I was in grad school, I was a study in counseling psychologist. And I had always had these dreams to work in television. And I was like, I have to do this. And I found a way to become a production assistant on a production that was happening in a rural part of Pennsylvania. It was like out in the middle of nowhere. They had opened a sound stage. And I said, if I take this risk, I had to quit my job at that point that had benefits and a 401k and all of those things. And I, I believed and I wanted to stay focused. And so what I would say from that is if you really believe and you know that you know that you know that you want to do this thing, stay focused, and then you might be able to create lanes for yourself within things. And I wouldn't underestimate production houses. There are production houses that are here that are, you know, contracting, there. you know, over to Netflix and Disney and Pixar, and they're in little pockets. So it's do your research and stay focused on what it is that you want. Search animation houses in New York. There are definitely a lot here. My name is Lisa. I'm actually studying now in Amsterdam and I came here 
an exchange to for them. My major is, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my major is in media and digital culture, and I have a question for Kate. And actually, I really like your scientific approach to creative media. I think it's quite a nice experience. All. So my question is, like, you stay in your company for seven years, and you really like grew out that career ladder. And how do you make sure once you get a stable position that you really want to stay in company and like grow all you need to need? And if you stay, what what are the tips for growing in your career? I think what I was mentioning before is, you know, if it's not a lateral move or a vertical move, like a promotion, it's about making the most of your opportunity while like in the position that you're in. So like I was saying earlier, it's, it's meeting with new people. And in seven, the company that I work for is very matrixed as I'm sure that, it, you know, a lot of us can relate to. Um, and what that means is it takes a village to get a project off the ground. Like I am so dependent on so many different stakeholders. And the reason I bring that up is the first year of me being there, maybe even the first two years of me being there was about relationship building and finding out like I still come to work and I'm like, I had no idea there was a department that does this. Um, and so I'm going to go like talk to someone in that department and understand how that relates to what I'm I'm doing. So I think that's that's the advice is just even within your own organization seek out kind of different perspectives. I work for a marketing, like the marketing organization. Um, and I constantly am reminded to get out of that bubble um, based on the different, you know, teams we work with. Our digital team, for example, is separate than our marketing organization. We have property folks. And when we go film, just seeing things from their side of the, the world is really illuminating for me and helps me do my job better because I'm taking different points of view into consideration. So I would just say like, um, to continue my bloom and blossom metaphor for the night, it's like kind of bloom where you're planted. Like water yourself where you're planted and you you will find opportunities to grow in that role. Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a recent marketing graduate. I'm also a content creator. I've amassed about over 1.6 million followers all over my social media platforms. But even so, I'm a recent graduate, so I obviously don't have experience, but I do feel like I have a lot of value to offer. So how can I set myself apart and get more recruiters' attention? I mean, at McKinsey, uh, we have a program called uh, our Build Fellows, which is precisely aimed to address this issue, right? Saying that people coming out of uh, college have a lot of interesting backgrounds and in your case, a big social media, but don't have the work experience, if you will. So it's a program where we kind of take people straight out of college and give them a two year, four different stints in different parts of McKinsey. Um, so if you go to, Mike actually runs the program for us, um, but if you go to McKinsey.com careers and the fellows program, that's precisely aimed at uh, what you're talking about. I just wanna just add that, you know, if you're making content on your own, like being in control of what you make. So maybe you can't get hired to write a bunch of articles for, you know, some, you know, BuzzFeed or something. Well, if an applicant showed up at my desk and said, well, you know, I haven't been able to secure a job, but every, you know, like the example of doing your own Substack, like every week I do a recap of whatever, I do a review of all the places I ate, ate you know, ate at. And if someone could show me, you know, I did one, I wrote one review and posted it online or like that would show me so much initiative that they, this is a person who wants to be writing they're practicing writing, they're putting themselves out there. Like I wouldn't remotely care how many likes they got. It's just the fact of like the discipline of, I kept, I kept at it and I kept, you know, or I took a workshop or just anything that shows me that you're trying to put yourself out there and learn is, that's what I want to see. Hi, my name is Elijah Morales. I'm a senior at Queens College. I do advertising, um, but not only that, I'm also a freelance uh, content creator. I like to uh, do videos, promotional videos, music videos, animations, motion graphics. I'm, I'm trying to learn it all, you know. Um, but my question is, in an, era, in an era where content is constantly produced and consumed, how do you ensure that your work not only captures attention, but also leaves a lasting impact on your audience? Great question. Um, the quick answer is tell stories that matter. The longer answer is have a big promotional budget. Um, <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> I mean, I think if you start with the first, you unlock the second, right? So 
I, I just think about, you know, in my world, we're telling brand stories or brand adjacent stories, but I always have to sort of do my, my real world check is like, is this a story that if you strip everything out from the brand, every brand message or every sort of thing we look at and say, that's brand voice, that's brand tone, brand personality. If you strip it out, will someone still watch this? And will they have an emotional connection to this person that is doing amazing things out in the world with us or without us? I think that's, that's my like litmus test of what stories matter. So I would, I would say that's my answer. I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that. Authenticity and vulnerability. For me, it, like it, without those two things, like, I don't know how you could connect, really connect with someone in a lasting way. You might entertain them. Like it might be, you know, funny or, you know, interesting for the moment, but I think authenticity and vulnerability is what's going to really get people to connect with you. You don't feel like you can get people to connect with Barbie? A lot of people connected with Barbie. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> highest grossing film, yeah. <laughs> my highest opening weekend. I think yeah. what they, what Mattel and Warner Brothers realized is there's a nostalgia, but also, if, so like for us old folks in the room, there's nostalgia, um, but obviously that had relevance to a younger generation. I remember seeing the, the movie this summer and the 15 year olds that were sitting behind me were crying and it was, a, it was a moment where I was like, oh, this is a generation, like you have bridged a generation, multiple generations between me and a 15 year old. But um, I think there's, something was unlocked. Do I think that's repeatable in the same fashion? No, but like, how do we each, how do we make our own Barbie and like, without the budget that <laughs> Warner Brothers and Mattel had? And, I, and I would say there was a lot of vulnerability in that because Mattel made fun of itself. Exactly made fun of Barbie. Barbie, you know, so that to me was, was, I think what made, I think without Mattel being vulnerable and make, and kind of making fun of itself, the movie would have been toast. It, would, it wouldn't have worked. This might be a little bit of a broad question, but I know some people will hear it. So have you ever experienced imposter syndrome or feeling like you don't belong in the universe? Every day. Every, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, for me, so when, um, my prior job, I was hired to run licensed publishing. So I was the person brought in to be the expert. So there really wasn't anyone around me to challenge what I was doing. And it was, it was very uncomfortable. Um, and I just had to remind myself, like, put on your big girl pants, say it like you mean it. And even if you're nervous, say it like you mean it. You know, you got there for a reason. You got hired into that position for a reason and just keep, keep putting on the big girl pants every day until it, they just go on and you don't even notice anymore. I think it's just a constant self-encouragement. <laughs> I don't think it goes away. Just the imposter syndrome. And you can also turn it into a bit more of a positive thing, right? As I was saying, <laughs> in my McKinsey role, I've never done this kind of a role before. So you go in thinking that this could actually be a complete disaster, right? It shouldn't hold you back from a fear point of view, but it should be, allow you to kind of be very open to kind of saying, I have a lot to learn as well, even though you're coming in, in my case, like Sam, I came in as the publisher, right? But there were like 50 people in the team who've been doing this for 10 years. So if you can say, look, I have some interesting ideas, and, but I also can learn from you. And almost every day I tell somebody, I don't know how to do something. Right. And that's a good way to kind of make them feel like, okay, at least, you know, he's admitting to, you know, not knowing things. So you can play off the imposters, imposter syndrome to actually a positive outcome. Hi, um, my name's Mara. Um, I'm 23. So hearing you guys talk about your advice for 23 year olds, you know, really hits home for me. Um, I'm a freelance writer and I do some social media stuff. And my question is sort of similar to that, um, but it's for people who are searching for work, which is what I'm currently doing. Um, so I would describe myself as creative and I've done social media. I do like some film stuff. I've really tried to sort of um, take, a, take on a lot of different um, opportunities that are in just sort of the creative space. And my question is for people who are like beginning their job search, who are sort of trying to figure out if they are, I guess, if they are creative or if they, I guess, I'm sorry, I'm trying to phrase it, but basically how do you get the confidence and how do you keep yourself 
motivated when it feels like it's like a, you don't have what it takes or it's really hard to know if you are really like there are so many creative people like in this room and just everywhere applying for these positions and how do you like I guess feel like you can sell yourself and feel like you have what it takes unfortunately at the entry level there's not a lot of jobs for generals right meaning that people who can do seven things are useful once they're inside but most of the jobs tend to be a little narrower in terms of saying here's our need and we need somebody to kind of do this and then you could bring a lot of other skills so i think looking at your portfolio of interests and your experience a little bit whatever you've done and kind of picking one or two things and saying this is what i want to kind of open the door with right? and kind of honing in on that. And sometimes that might mean that you have five different resumes, right? depending on what the opening is somewhere. I've also found that starting off by saying, what are the companies or organizations out there, or what's media out there that seems interesting and where I would love to work and then working backward from there, right? Saying like, what do they do when if they have an opening, can I tailor my resume to kind of highlight that aspect? So I think it'll require a little bit more of like narrowing at the beginning to be able to go in and then do broader things. I would just like to add also in the world of confidence and, and confidence building, I like that you were vulnerable enough to, to say that because there are a lot of folks in this room that are like, I'm not confident. Hence, you know, hence the question about imposter syndrome. But what I will say is confidence is built and defined by tackling a task. So you do that thing and you do it over and over and over again. If you do it the wrong way, you learn something from the time that you did it the wrong way. And, you know, in the world of, you know, writing and, and being 23, you should have a, a nonlinear path. That's your story to tell. That makes your story way more vast and way more rich. So I would say build the confidence by doing the thing over and over and over and over again. Hey guys, my name's Jack. I go to Rutgers in New Jersey uh, and I'm studying communications. I'm a junior. My question to you guys is you're talking about like problem solving, creating schedules, talking to people all day. It's very overwhelming sometimes. So I was wondering like what brings you back to yourself like centers everything at the end of the day? Okay, so I'm going to quote Simon Sinek. If you haven't read him before, um, it starts with the why. So like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? It's more than just a job description. It's more than just kind of what your boss needs on their desk at the end of the day kind of thing. It's like, why am I doing this? And that's what kept me in my role for so long. Um, it's about the learning, about the problem solving, showing up with curiosity, but it's also the why. Like I have a really clear why of why I'm in this role and what I want to achieve and the time frame I want to achieve it within. Um, so that would, that would be like the center is really, you know, I think he even has like a concentric circle diagram where it's literally why is in the middle. It's not the what, it's not the how, it's the why. Um, and I think just from a personal standpoint, I think that keeps you motivated, you know, when you're, you're looking at your email at 11 p.m. and you're like, can this wait till tomorrow? You're like, it's just, that's sort of what I come back to. Um, it's just how do you show up every Monday? How do you leave, you know, the office on a Friday, like remembering why you're there and what you're, what you're trying to achieve. Hi, thank you guys for being here and um, talking to us and answering these questions. Uh, my name is Noelle. I just finished my master's graduate school from Brooklyn College Fierstein in like media scoring and sonic arts in May. And I, my, yeah, I have a question for um, how much, I've been really interested in getting into like audio branding, sonic branding, um, and my like, the past, you know, years of my life have been kind of all over the place between like creative work within music, administrative and education, for like children's, um, uh, and pivoting into a career in audio branding, like how, but also desiring to work um, and grow within a company is how much of a demand do you see for in-house people that are uh, focused in like audio sound music on the creative side or is that typically something that's just outsourced more than not? 
That sounds like a really cool career path, by the way. <laughs> like I, everything needs a sound, you know, everything has a sound. Um, every brand we can think of just those iconic brands. And you think of the sounds that show up on podcasts, that show up in commercials and advertisement. I think the quick answer um, for me is we do a lot of outsource. Like I have a very small team. So a lot of, you know, I don't have a physical content studio. Um, so we do a lot of outsourcing of very specific creative but, you know, I think there's an opportunity if you look at a lot of brands do have in-house teams. Um, so I would I would say look at those maybe smaller brand houses where they are bringing folks in or maybe they're kind of building that capability to be in-house and, and think about kind of where you could apply your expertise in a lot of different places. Thank you. And would you recommend like, sorry, just... Um not instead of perhaps looking for like titles of in job searches, maybe just like reaching out to. I would say companies. anything that has like a film or content or video or mar I mean, even marketing, marketing, marketing yeah. communications. Like I would just sort of start poking and asking questions. Asking questions. Okay. Yeah. At, at my agency, we have two editors who work with us. And I will tell you, there is one editor who really stands out with everything this person produces. And it stands out because of the sound that is applied to it. So, you know, there are so many different stories that are told in one piece of content. There's verbal, there's nonverbal, there's written. There's so many different aspects. And so if you have the zone of genius to make sure that yours is bolstered and it stands out, lean into that. And I would market myself as a brand you know, uh, and you don't have to say sound expert and all of the things that people like to do, the superlatives, but really market yourself in this world because there are not a lot of folks there. They're, and I would say, because I've worked in the world of editing, one of our clients um, is Serena Williams and we used to produce all of her content. And we had two editors on the team. And I would tell you, she would have to pick videos all of the time. And really the, the one editor whose video she would pick over and over again, it was because this editor would put like a little kind of, and sometimes it was just like a little swoosh, or maybe it was a, you know, her hitting the tennis racket. It could be one little thing, but what he did to make himself stand apart was just putting a definitive sound on every single piece of content that he produced, and it became his a bit of his trademark. Mm -hmm. So I would say sound is powerful. I also work with deaf and hard of hearing communities, so I would also argue and advocate for folks that can't use sound to also figure out the other component of sound that accompanies, you know, if if folks that you know for folks that that aren't listening to things, mm -hmm. are there different captioning that you could use that you could accompany that actually tells something melodic or poetic as you are, you know, putting yeah. it into a piece of content. Awesome. Thank you. And I have an exercise for all of you to do. I know sound off is a thing in social media right now, but go watch a film specifically in the horror genre or the scary movies and watch it with the volume off and tell me like how different your experience is. So I think like that's a credit um, you know, I've worked with a lot of sound folks in the field and it's never a second or forgotten thought about, you know, we always think about video and sound on equal planes. So more kudos to that career path for you. Yeah. Well, one round of applause. <laughs>